Um, hello, everybody who is here in the room uh, with us and uh, to those who joined online, especially thank you to uh, all the people um, who have a, a very inconvenient time. I know it's 4 a.m. in Europe uh, and my colleagues are there online and uh, also um, also, we have a uh, speaker online, uh, Lutz Moller, Dr. Lutz Moller, who is with us uh, at such an early hour. So thank you so much. Um, so my name is Satevik Grigorian, and uh, I work for UNESCO, for those of you who, who just joined us. Um, and I work on UNESCO's Internet Universality of Romex Indicators. And uh, I have an I'm really honored to be uh, sitting next to people who were at the cornerstone of uh, developing the indicators and then supporting the launch and progress of the indicators who will be sharing their thoughts um, on the on the process and then on the progress and as well as uh, further updates. Uh, so um, so I would like to start by a video message for from the UNESCO's Assistant Director General for Communication and Information, who unfortunately couldn't be here with us, but he sent a video message, which I would now like uh, to request the technical team to play. Thank you. Distinguished participants, esteemed colleagues, and honorable guests, I'm delighted to extend a warm welcome to all of you at the Dynamic Coalition on Rome X Indicators session, which takes place during the Internet Governance Forum 2023 in Kyoto. As we gather today, we are surrounded by passionate individuals who share a common vision, an Internet ecosystem that upholds rights, embraces openness, fosters accessibility, and evolves through the collective efforts of its stakeholders. Personally, I regret not being able to join you physically in Kyoto due to a scheduled conflict with the UNESCO Executive Board meeting in Paris, which I need to participate in. As the UNESCO Assistant Director General for Communication and Information, I had the privilege of attending the previous editions of IGF, including the last two ones held in Poland and in Ethiopia. This platform has consistently proven invaluable for fostering meaningful discussions about the Internet's pivotal role in our digital age. Today, our focus is on the ever-evolving landscape of Internet governance and the ongoing refinement of the Internet Universality Rome X indicators. Our gathering represents more than just a dialogue. It's a call for collective action. Five years have passed since the endorsement of the Internet Universality Indicators by UNESCO's Intergovernmental Council of the International Programme for the Development of Communication. During this time, we have witnessed the transformative power of these indicators in shaping national digital policies. Yet, the lessons learned and the challenges faced over these years underscore the need for continuous evolution and adaptation. As you mark this five-year milestone, we are actively engaged in refining the framework to ensure its continued relevance in our ever-evolving digital world. I urge each one of you to draw upon the collective wisdom of this forum. Share your insights, your strategies for success, and also the obstacles you have faced. I further encourage you to highlight the framework strengths and identify areas that need enhancement. Let's ensure that our deliberations here translate into tangible benefits for all stakeholders of the Rome X framework. I thank you all for your unwavering commitment and active participation in this pivotal session at IGF 2023. Let's work together in shaping an internet that genuinely serves the interests of all. Thank you for your kind attention. So I uh, thank our Assistant Director General for Communication Info and Information for sending this message and uh, for the uh, leadership in this process and without any delay I would like to present our first speaker 
uh, David Sucher, who has been uh, who is referred to as the architect of the uh, <laughs> of the AI uh, Romex uh, framework. Well, personally, I call people who have been in the cornerstone co parents of the <laughs> of the framework. Uh, so uh, I would like uh, David to request you to please talk about the uh, the process of uh, de developing the indicators and then progress and then as we are approaching this five year mark and planning to revise uh, to ensure the relevance continued relevance of the indicators to speak about uh, what direction we, we should move uh, towards. Thank you very much. Um, well, thank you and. Uh, I should say, firstly, I should apologize for the fact that I have to leave at, uh, uh, for another session which begins at quarter past three. So when I get up and walk out, it's not a gesture of protest or anything <laughs> like that. It's, it's just I need to move to something else. Um, but I thought I'd give you a kind of origin story of the, um, uh, of the IUIs, uh, Internet Universality Indicators. And they stem from uh, a concept of Internet Universality that was devised by Guy Berger when he was working for UNESCO back in 2013, before the, um, the uh, tenure review of the World Summit. Um, uh, in fact, I remember him walking up to me at a UNESCO conference at that time and presenting me with this and saying, what do you think of this proposal for universality approach based around the four tenets or four principles of rights, openness, accessibility for all, and multi-stakeholder engagement? Um, uh, the idea emerged eventually from, uh, from that concept when it was taken up by UNESCO formally uh, of having an indicator framework which was modeled along the lines of uh, one of the previous, in the, or the, one of the existing UNESCO indicator frameworks, the media development indicators on which I'd also worked um, in the past. So the indicator framework should be one that would include quantitative and qualitative assessment. Um, so it wouldn't just be about numbers. It would be one that would support national researchers assess, to assess their national performance, but it wasn't intended to, it wouldn't be intended to, to compare one country against another. It would be about looking at the country itself internally. Uh, and it would aim to identify practical interventions that could improve internet performance in relation to those principles of rights, openness, accessibility, and multi stakeholder engagement. Um, principles, practical interventions developed through dialogue amongst national stakeholders, so bringing together uh, the diverse communities which are engaged within the internet. Um, I ended up leading the development of uh, this indicator framework in association with APC and uh, with my colleague, Henri van der Spey, who's in the room at the back. Um, so the aim was always to build a large data set, and it is a very large data set uh, that uh, uh, presented within the indicators. The aim was always to build a large data set um, for analysis for a couple of reasons. Um, first is because the availability of data is very variable between countries. Um, and so in some countries, there are really very few uh, data sets that would be available, and qualitative sources would be particularly important. Uh, in others, there were many more. Um, our aim was to try and build a collage from the evidence that was available that would enable the best possible analysis within the country itself. Um, and the second point was to uh, include indicators which would enable the researchers to look at issues that were particularly important in their countries but might not be important in other countries. Um, so to take up those specific themes. We went through a couple of really extensive consultation processes about what should be in these indicators, and that did tend to grow the number even more. Uh, and we also decided to round out the Rome framework with the X category, which would bring in a number of important other issues into the analysis of the national internet environment. So this made for a, a lot of indicators, and we decided to offer two approaches to that. Um, first, a comprehensive set, which is in this rather thick book here. Um, and secondly, uh, a smaller core set that would be more manageable. I, I just have a question for you on that one. Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, uh, a core set of indicators which would be more manageable um, for particularly in countries with um, relatively limited resources, so in the hope that that would encourage more diverse research. And 
practice, uh, this is a disappointment to me, actually. In practice, almost every country has chosen to concentrate solely on the, the core indicators and uh, hasn't really looked in the wider range for other indicators that are particularly important in their, in the, their own country. And I think that's one of the issues that the review should look at, how to encourage, um, how, how to avoid missing the opportunity that that presents. So we put a lot of emphasis as well on the need for a multi-stakeholder approach with a multi-stakeholder advisory board to oversee uh, processes, um, but also a multi-stakeholder research team bringing different types of expertise into a group that could look at things together and then discuss their findings from their different perspectives. A couple of countries trail the indicators, including Brazil, um, and uh, in order to validate them and the whole the scheme was then signed off by the IFAP committee in UNESCO, which gave it a kind of crucial status and um, authorization by UNESCO's member states. Uh, so the outcome, um, as I suspect you know, is that there have been really rather a large number of implementations of these indicators. There have been a lot more uh, implementations of them than I had expected there to be uh, in, the in the early stages, and in fact a lot more uh, implementations than of the media development indicators. Um, I think that probably indicates that there was a very substantial demand for something along these lines which would enable national research teams to work on a, uh, on a national assessment. Um, but I'd also give a good deal of credit to Katavik's predecessor, Shan Hong Hu, um, who was immensely enthusiastic in promoting the indicators uh, and uh, supporting countries over the last few years in putting them together. Having read a number of the reports, not all of them, um, I think I'd emphasize three or four things which seem to me to be important in making a successful research project using them. Um, the first is the importance of diversity within the research team uh, and the advisory board, but I think the research team is particularly important um, that is, expertise across the different areas of rights, uh, openness, access, multi-stakeholder participation, and issues such as gender and sustainable development, which are in the X category. Uh, if you bring together people with different expertise, you get more than the sum of the parts. Um, the importance of avoiding political pressure uh, to come to positive conclusions when those might not be justified. Um, and avoiding the pressure that comes from vested interests. Again, it's valuable here to have diversity within the research team and the advisory board. I'd stress the need to pay as much attention to qualitative assessments as to quantitative indicators. Um, and as I've mentioned, to look at the non-core indicators to see which are particularly relevant to a country's national context. Um, I think I'd stress the importance of the research team discussing and analyzing findings as a group rather than just reporting on their own area of expertise um, and on building that discussion as a, that um, that collective analysis as the way of uh, reporting rather than a box ticking exercise which any ex any indicator framework is vulnerable to and i think i'd stress the desirability of making recommendations that are practically achievable in the national context, uh, which includes the political context. So to identify those things which can move um, things forward in the categories that are covered by the indicators. Um, so the practical rather than the ideal. Um, now, it was always intended to revise these indicators after a period of time. Uh, in fact, it's long, they've, uh, they've been used uh, unrevised for rather longer than we'd uh, originally expected. Um, uh, it's important to bring them up to date in terms of what evidence can now be gathered and in terms of the issues on which uh, evidence should now be gathered if we're to have a comprehensive picture of a national internet environment. So I hope that this revision will um, be able to do that, to um, bring them up to date without making it uh, too difficult to, within a particular country, to look back at an assessment that's already been done. So building on what is there, uh, developing it and evolving it for future needs, retaining consistency where appropriate. Um, I think it will be necessary to reduce the overall number, 
um, and I hope it will be possible to encourage a more holistic assessment approach than uh, has always been the case. Um, I, there are media development indicators assessments that I think will be quite a good model there to look at. Um, I would resist the temptation to omit things for the sake of omitting them. Uh, I think um, not least because of the differences between different countries and the fact that different countries need um, need different points uh, 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 of reference. Um, but there may be better ways of doing that than dividing simply between a comprehensive and a core indicator set. Um, and I would encourage more inclusion of, uh, uh, of non-core indicators where these are relevant. But um, that's, I think, what I'd say about the, re the revision process, which I know is at an early stage, and I'm not directly personally involved in it. Um, so, or more from you. It's not my responsibility. Um, but, um, but I am looking forward to continuing to work with these indicators and the Rome uh, principles in the future. So thanks. Thank you very much, David, and thank you again for, uh, for your work in uh, put in um, uh, well um, in um, uh, putting the indicators together and uh, for continuing the the support uh, to us uh, and for your valuable recommendations as we move forward with the. Uh, with the recommendations, and we do very much hope, as a member of the steering committee, <laughs> uh, for the revision of IUI, you will still be very actively involved in the revision process. Uh, so, uh, thank you very much. Um, I would uh, be happy to provide actually uh, updates on on uh, the process so and on our progress of uh, implementing the. Um, the IUIs uh, globally, but I am aware that our next speaker as well has to uh, leave to attend other engagements. Our next speaker online, Dr. Lutz Moller, the Deputy Secretary General at German Commission for UNESCO. So Dr. Moller, the, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me well. Very well, can thank you. you. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon in Japan and good dis good morning here from Europe. I'm also in Paris at the UNESCO Executive Board, like the ADG. Excellencies, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, um, I think uh, it's not really necessary to say that we have observed an, a really uh, enormous and very rapid uh, involvement of internet ecosystems over the last few months. Um, as a key example, the fundamental changes that several social media platforms that span the globe much more than technical alterations or, sim um, or simple moder uh, moderations of one arbitrary product, they have fundamentally altered societal discourses in countries around the globe and have had enormous reverberations in terms of visibility of certain political convictions instead of others and the ability and disinformation to spread. I, of course, speak about X.com, but also could speak about TikTok, Meta, Telegram, and more nationally successful platforms such as Parler, Korean neighbor of Vietnamese Salo. In Germany, the more non-profit Fediverse with Mastodon has been uh, has ha had su some successes over the last year, but even here, we do not at all see a shift away from the private sector organized social media platforms. It is really not a news item in this uh, year 2023, but the way public discourse, public conversation about the future of society and the planet is shaped and influenced by private business interests. And this has been never more acute than in the last 12 months. As you know all very well, the challenges posed by artificial intelligence come on top, as Freedom House has warned us last week in their Freedom of the Net report. More specifically, the use of artificial intelligence to hinder and interrupt public discourse, to repress and to manipulate. Therefore, we really need to strengthen internet ecosystems that are freer, more democratic, more nonprofit, more in the public service. We need to strengthen and safeguard human rights, openness, justice, diversity, inclusion, participation, empowerment, and well being in these internet ecosystems. And this is exactly, as you all know, basically where the UNESCO Internet Universality indicators of the Rome IUIs come into play. Um, as you know, Germany has been the fifth UNESCO member state globally and the first from the global north to utilize the 
this instrument to appropriately measure whether national internet policy making and the implementation of these policies into practice, whether they really live up to this ambition of human rights openness, access, and multi-stakeholder participation. The big advantage from our perspective, from our experience, is that the Romex IUI deliver that they focus not only on one or few indicators, they provide a more panoramic view which also, I have said that previously, is some brutally honest evidence. Actually, we all know that governments can easily claim that their policies and practices are human rights based, but are they really? Are they really open? Do they really allow access to all? And are they really governed through a true multi-stakeholder participation, or is this word just used as a euphemism for industry lobbying? The application of the Rome IUI, Rome X IUI in Germany was a joint endeavor by the German Commission for UNESCO as coordinator, the German Federal Foreign Office as political and financial supporter, and the Leibniz Institute, Hans Bredow Institute as implementer. Today I will not repeat previously reported results from Germany that we have had, such as the insufficient balance in our country we found between the right to privacy and freedom of expression or the insufficient internet access of jobless persons or the elderly. The key question of today is what can we suggest from our experience for the upcoming revision? As I said, the huge advantage is this panor panoramic view which they generate. We have clearly benefited from this approach. However, my main point is that while providing this panoramic view, we found that the number of indicators, currently 303, including 109 core indicators, is probably too high. I said it with what has uh, what David Sauter has said before about the general approach to the Rome X IUI, which we perfectly under understand and share. Still, we recommend a stronger focus on key areas and topics with the greatest relevance. In particular, we should note data availability. Even if an indicator is excellent in theory, it is of little use if there is no data available or if the indicator cannot possibly be operationalized appropriately. Several of these IUI indicators are not as practical as they appear in theory. I heard with great interest that David also spoke about the need to reduce the number of indicators and I agree with him that we have to be very careful in that regard. And I also have to share with you that this is a common experience. We have also worked with several of the SDG indicators in Germany over the last couple of years and have found out that also some of them sound fantastic in theory, but are very, very difficult to operationalize. So we really recommend to use this opportunity also for a general up-to-date check to make that, to make sure that the IUI really capture also more modern, more up-to-date trends such as AI. On another item, we strongly recommend uh, from our ex experience in Germany that member states use a multi-stakeholder advisory board. In, bo in Germany, this board has proven enormously useful, specifically when it comes to selling and communicating the results to the political stakeholders later on. And in particular, as current debates tend to weaken multi-stakeholder participation, it's more necessary than ever, not just in the application of the IUI. In closing, we at the German Commission for UNESCO and also the Hans Predo Institute joined the dynamic coalition on the IUI from the start to share our experiences and good practices. We offer our support to other parties and other member states to enable them to apply the IUI in their own countries. And we look forward to working together on the revision as well in the years to come to keep them up to date with ongoing developments. And I thank you very much for your attention and thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you very much, Mr. Mulder. Thank you for your uh, support to the IUI project and also to the support uh, to the uh, Dynamic Coalition for IUI and for encouraging uh, more uh, stakeholders to join. Um, okay. Yeah, David needs to leave to attend another important session. So thank you so very much, David. Again, thank you for your continued support. Let's give him a, an applaud, a round of applause. Uh. So, um, and I, yes, Dr. Moller is also, yes, leaving soon. Thank you. Uh, thank you as well, uh, Dr. Moller. Well, we can give Dr. Moller as well a round of applause. 
as I didn't mention his name uh, <laughs> with the first round. Thank you so very much, and uh, let's carry on with our discussion. Actually, I know that there are people here who uh, who I talked with about the IUI, um, IUI Realmix project, and who uh, would actually uh, be interested to uh, to know about the project. So I will just give a very brief overview for them, for those who are new to this uh, initiative. So um, I'm sure you grasped uh, uh, a lot from David's um, uh, uh, inputs, but uh, just to, to give you an idea. So Internet Universality is the um, uh, official position of UNESCO on the Internet. Um, so UNESCO believes that internet should be universal based on principles, uh, on, on these principles of rights, openness, accessibility to all, uh, and nurtured uh, by multi-stakeholder participation. Uh, and so this was the, uh, in the heart of the internet universality framework, which we uh, then added an X to, ROM X, uh, X standing for cross-cutting issues such as gender equality, safety and security, uh, sustainable development and environment. Uh, so uh, we have in total, uh, they've talked uh, already about the number of indicators. We have a lot uh, of them, 303 indicators with 109 core indicators, core being those that we recommend that they are essential to implement at least uh, as baseline. And then uh, countries are free to, based on their uh, national context, to choose and um, uh, implement other uh, additional indicators as well. And so um, uh, we have um, an eight-step uh, process, and I, I would like to talk about the establishment of multi-stakeholder advisory board, uh, which David mentioned and uh, Dr. Moller also highlighted its importance. So we do believe in a multi-stakeholder approach to internet governance, uh, which is also um, uh, promoted by the by the Internet Governance Forum. So it is an essential part of uh, this research. Uh, so the group um, is con uh, consists normally of um, uh, government representatives, uh, representatives of relevant ministries, civil society organizations, academia, private sector, representatives of marginalized groups. Uh, this group uh, is sort of an oversight body which uh, guides the um, uh, research uh, and uh, 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 in the end of the research also looks at the outcomes and uh, what we call validation workshop validates uh, the results of the workshop uh, confirming that this is indeed uh, the um, the uh, state of the play in the country in their respective uh, concerned areas. So uh, this uh, assessment, uh, this framework indeed is a unique global tool, um, is a unique tool available to implement the development of the internet uh, at the national level. And it also, it's not a standalone, it, uh, it also um, uh, supports in a way the um, achievement of sustainable development goals and is also in line with, uh, um, uh, with a number of topics now discussed at the G uh, Global G Digital Compact. Um, so currently um, uh, the framework, the assessment is ongoing in 40 countries, actually 34 with six uh, having published the report. So just to give you a visual idea, because I avoided using presentations, so this is um, uh, the indicators, uh, the framework, which is available on our website. So if you go to unesco.org, and I'll be happy to share my contact as well afterwards and uh, look for unis in, uh, Internet Universality Indicators. Um, and uh, so the, um, I have here, this is how the report in the end looks like. This I, I have the copy of uh, uh, the report from Brazil and uh, we have Alessandri here and uh, Fabio here who not only supported the uh, creation of the indicators but also were one of the, actually the first ones to implement the uh, indicators uh, in Brazil. Uh, so currently, so six reports published so far, um, three in Africa, uh, one in Europe, Germany, um, one in Thailand and Brazil. And currently the process is ongoing in 34 countries with Kenya actually doing a second follow-up assessment to uh, measure the results achieved um, 
after the mm, after the publication of the report um, and so we have 15 in uh, in Africa uh, 12 in South uh, South Asia 15 in Asia and the Pacific um, and five in Latin America three in Europe um, and uh, two in Arab states and actually, uh, I'm happy to say that we, uh, out of uh, this country, seven are small islands and developing states, uh, with five in uh, South Pacific uh, um, islands. Uh, so um, we have had quite uh, serious results. Dr. Moller already uh, presented a little bit uh, the achievements in Germany. Uh, our assessments help to inform uh, policymakers uh, and uh, feed into the digital strategies, laws and regulations, and we are happy to uh, continue our progress. And so um, now I would like to give the floor to, sorry, because we have a missing uh, speaker. I'd like to give the floor to Alessandra Barbosa, uh, Regional Center for Studies of the Development of the Information so uh, so uh, Society, CETIC.br. Um, and actually, this is a UNESCO Category 2 Institute, and I won't be telling more about you uh, because there is so much to say. Please add whatever you, you would like to add, and uh, please, floor is yours around the topic of the discussion today. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Atatafik, and good afternoon, everyone. Well, it's a pleasure to be here in this discussion because, uh, as um, it was already mentioned, uh, Nick.pr we're in the very beginning of this discussion since the concept of universality. And in my opinion, um, this is a very important achievement because uh, although indicators may change over time and concepts may change, like in the past, what we considered uh, internet users, uh, today is very different, right? So uh, the definitions may change and they should be revised from time to time, but principles are really important. And I think that uh, this framework was um, a very important achievement that UNESCO made in terms of um, defining important principles. The Rome X that was already explained, what means R-O-A-M and X, uh, so I'm not going to repeat, but th the principles should not change, they should remain. So uh, I think that we are now in a moment after five years that uh, it was approved um, in 2015, uh, right? I guess that uh, it was approved, 18, yeah, 18. So um, it's time now to make an, uh, an assessment on the framework based on the, the need of revising principles, but uh, not, not principles, indicators. And I think that um, as already has been stressed by both speakers that presi uh, presided me, um, in terms of uh, the number of indicators, it is indeed a huge number of indicators, more than 300, the whole set, and the core indicators um, 109. But the fact is that the scope that this uh, framework uh, aims to measure really requires m a lot of indicators. And I think that uh, what we have uh, realized among these years, and now we, uh, with more than 40 countries making this assessment, is that we have a very problematic issue of data gap. Many countries, they don't have the required data to make this assessment. But at the same time, it was, uh, from my point of view, uh, following all these uh, reports and assessment, because uh, CETIC had the chance to revise some countries, like uh, uh, the countries in Latin America, and add some other countries in Africa. Even in, in Europe, we worked with a German team during the assessment, sharing the Brazilian experience. But um, I having said that, I think that uh, this framework was an opportunity for countries to really understand the need of data production. We need data because we don't have when we don't have data, 
we don't have visibility. And if you don't have visibility, there is no priority in the political agenda. So, uh, and in this particular regard, I think that uh, Brazil is in a, posi in a position that we have for many, many years, almost 20 years of data production in different areas, right? Not only uh, among population, households, but enterprises, uh, schools, uh, health, uh, culture, government, and many other areas. So I think that uh, the Rome um, framework gave countries the opportunity to understand that they should uh, produce more data because we do have a lot of missing data in this uh, regard. And also, um, another very important achievement, in my opinion, is that uh, UNESCO soon realized that we should not have an index, right? It's not a matter of comparing countries here. We are using qualitative and quantitative type of indicators to take a picture, a general uh, overview of the situation of the internet development in a given country. So this is a, a very uh, good uh, thing that UNESCO soon realized that uh, the intention was to uh, have a, um, a panoramic view of internet development. Uh, a second very important point that I would like to highlight in this process is that not many countries uh, have the experience of uh, having a multi-stakeholder dialogue on internet development. Brazil is, uh, again, uh, a very good example of a successful model on uh, multi-stakeholder, a real multi-stakeholder uh, arrangement to debate internet governance. And since one of the uh, uh, conditions to implementation is to, uh, is to establish what uh, UNESCO has uh, denominated multi-stakeholder advisory board for the development of this assessment, many countries that had no experience in having a multi-stakeholder dialogue, they had to implement that. And this is a very important achievement, and we should keep it uh, this way, right? Um, well, just to mention that um, David has said that the disappointment about having many assessments focusing only on core indicators, and I agree with him that the ideal situation is to implement the whole set of indicators to, to give uh, a broad perspective on the internet development. But having this uh, condition may be in the revision we could uh, rethink of that. And CETIC has, been, CETIC has been involved with UNESCO and other expert uh, uh, steering committee for um, ROMEX discussing this revision. And at the end of the day, we realize that it's not possible to make such a drastic reduction in the indicators. So um, you, you have to we will have to face this reality and to decide what to do, but I probably agree that w we should stick with a m larger number of indicators uh, to have a, a better assessment. And last but not least, I would like to just take this opportunity to mention two things uh, related to ROMEX. Uh, we have uh, been discussing the application of this framework to different uh, other type of emerging technologies such as AI. When uh, ROMEX was approved in 2018, uh, we, did, uh, we didn't uh, have the new phenomena of uh, uh, large language models, for instance, and other AI-based applications. So I think that it is completely uh, uh, applicable to emerging technologies because we are talking about principles, and the principles should not change. Human rights-based, um, openness, accessibility, and multi-stakeholder, this could not change. And we could use this framework to apply. We have a other discussion going on right now, like the Global Digital cons com Compact and other uh, uh, issues, that we could rely on those principles. Um, again, on the X dimension, we in the revision, we already realized that we should 
fill some gaps that the original framework didn't uh, foreseen, such as uh, we, we had foreseen uh, gender, age scope, uh, children, but we need to include cybersecurity, sustainable development, climate change, uh, other dimensions relevant in the X dimension. Um, and last, I think that in this revision, we could uh, think of um, how to really encourage member states to make periodic assessment. Uh, I'm not sure if you can do it in two years' time, three years' time, but having uh, periodical measurement should be very important for um, policymakers, civil society, and uh, technical community to have a better idea of the progress a given country has made in terms of applying this uh, framework. So those are my initial um, reactions. I think that UNESCO plays a very important role um, in promoting and disseminating Romex uh, structure and framework um, that goes beyond internet uh, development, like AI, as I have said already. So those are my initial comments. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alexandre. Thank you for your valuable inputs and uh, thoughts. And also thank you very much for um, pointing out uh, that uh, this uh, this is not uh, meant for ranking, which I normally highlight uh, in in my presentation. So this is a voluntary assessment. I, I always highlight voluntary in the sense that uh, the country, the national stakeholder, they decide themselves um, on uh, doing uh, the assessment and then UNESCO is there to provide uh, technical guidance and support in, uh, in doing this and um, there is no ranking or comparison whatsoever and of course uh, for, the so for some countries the problems are similar the and, and it's very important to, um, to create this environment to share practices uh, and learn from each other experiences in moving forward with uh, with their national agendas, which uh, which in a way this dynamic coalition serves a platform for for sharing the ideas uh, and uh, lessons learned and experiences and um, best practices. So, so on this note, I would like to give the floor to Anya uh, Anya Gengo. Uh, who is from the IGF Secretariat and who has been with the, actually all of you have been uh, with the Dynamic Coalition longer than me and you've, uh, you've seen the development and uh, I would like to invite Anya to speak about uh, the role of the Dynamic Coalition, the progress, how we could improve it and any other, other inputs you and thoughts you have around uh, the topic of our discussion, please. Thank you very much, Tatevik, and thank you to UNESCO for, of course, organizing this session, but uh, even more for continuously throughout the year through the IGF platform and the Dynamic Coalition is working in a very open, transparent manner with stakeholders from around the world to not just promote the indicators, but really to understand the value of the indicators and precisely what we are discussing today, whether they're relevant, whether they're useful to people around the world, do we need them? And if yes, how do we use them? Do, do we have access and especially if we have enough resources and capacity to meaningfully use them? Uh, maybe I can start indeed from uh, from the Dynamic Coalition and the role of that platform and then I would like to say a few words about the um, relevance of the indicators uh, for, the for, for our presence and of course for the future. In terms of the Dynamic Coalition, uh, we at the IGF Secretariat witnessed the when this idea was born that a Dynamic Coalition could be organized just because it has been seen as a way to engage stakeholders from around the world into warm, friendly, meaningful discussions um, on, uh, on the way the uh, indicators could be used. I think it was formed after the indicators were adopted in 2018. And that was the whole idea to kind of follow the pace of the implementation and to understand if there are gaps, where are the gaps. Uh, it is incredible success in a very short time framework of the dynamic coalitions in terms of the number of stakeholders it managed to, to, um, to gather 
but also in terms of the quality of the um, inputs that the stakeholders are bringing, not just to these dynamic coalitions, but to the whole IGF as such. And uh, I think um, for us it was a really uh, lesson learned that these dynamic coalitions, which are very independent, they are also organic, um, and they have their own autonomy in terms of how they manage the process, it was a lesson learned that when you have a strong institution that stands behind a people-centered, people-led process, it really can work and it really can, uh, in a very short time, as I said, achieve incredible results. I think long-term speaking, uh, we from the Secretariat certainly would advise to continue doing the way um, that has been done so far in terms of um, embracing the community, the stakeholders, doing outreach in different forums, uh, and uh, especially engaging those that uh, unfortunately are still not meaningfully engaged um, in the overall internet governance uh, global processes. We through the IGF uh, have quite a nice overview of the stakeholders, types of people, profiles that unfortunately are already left behind and uh, I think it's important that we alarm the community to really work um, in a methodological way to engage those stakeholders. So if you look, uh, I'll, I'll be very brief on this, I won't certainly uh, divert the attention to the um, IGF and inclusion processes, but I do think it's important to say that there are, first of all, profiles coming from certain countries that are not present uh, in the global processes, such as the IGF, for example, but also other processes. I mean, at this forum you have, for example, um, colleagues coming from ICANN, colleagues coming from UNESCO doing wonderful things and uh, unfortunately uh, stakeholders from certain countries are missing. So this is something that the Secretariat is very much focusing on to hopefully remedy. And I'm very glad, for example, to say that there are countries from which we couldn't hear for the past, past 10 years of mm -hmm. the IGF that are now very active in the IGF ecosystem, not just at indi individual levels, but organizationally speaking, uh, you have the Maldives that are having wonderful national IGF and their organized multi-stakeholder participation at this year's IGF. And that's a, that's a really concrete and tangible difference that's been made through outreach done on, uh, on different platforms. So this is something that I think the Dynamic Coalition uh, could also do, engage those that are not engaged so far. We are, I think we've recognized in the past couple of years that uh, we really evolved from multi-stakeholder model toward the multidisciplinary model, which means that we have to look at each stakeholder group participation in a very nuanced way to understand that uh, these discussions, these dialogues, and potentially leading into, into decisions uh, really concerns us all, given the fact that we're all using our smartphones, our computers, meaning we're all there present in our online world. And uh, hopefully um, in the years to come also this dynamic coalition will see more disciplines represented uh, in the core organizational group of the, um, of the dynamic coalition itself. Uh, in terms of the validity, I completely agree and I think that can't be underlined enough uh, with everything that my uh, colleagues said previously with respect to the values. I think we're very much aligned in the fact that we strive for the highest values that hum humanity can strive in the online world as we do in our, let's call it, offline world. But if you look at these analog domains, for example, you know, the hum humanity, for example, and the highest international legal mechanisms guarantee right to life, for example, but then you still have some jurisdictions that recognize that sentence as a sanction. So while some not. So these, there are fundamental differences between how are we approaching to implement the values that we agree on. And the digital world is in that sense not different than to this analog domain as well. There are jurisdictions where if you say something on social media is first of all interpreted as exercising your freedom of expression, while in some jurisdictions, a tweet or social media post can potentially lead to imprisonment or fining. So those are the differences. I think we have to be aware of them and we need to make sure that the implementation of the values that we believe in is in the right hands. Two years ago in Poland, we had a session on this same subject. We were assessing how the assessment is going and I do recall when I was sitting uh, next to my colleague Kossi from Benin, Benin IGF, he coordinates the IGF uh, in, in Benin, we spoke about the implementation uh, being done through a multi-stakeholder lens, that all stakeholders in the country have opportunity to be consulted, 
and to have a say when you are assessing the ecosystem. And I do think that's still very much relevant two years after. Being said that, the values are relevant. It's excellent to see that the number of national assessments are growing, but I do think that now, compared to the period during the pandemic and after, we may be in a phase where the assessment needs to be assessed. And that's because the COVID pandemic that really changed our landscape. And I'm sure I don't need to speak about the fact, but if you look just at the legislation field, it's more than palpable, it's more than visible that that field is dramatically changing. Um, much of these uh, in institutions, initiatives are now growing that are measuring, for example, the number of laws that are regulating, let's say, artificial intelligence, given the fact that it's on the rise. And some of uh, them are indicating that before the pandemic, we spoke just about one or two national jurisdictions that had a law in place reflecting artificial intelligence. After the pandemic, so last year, this year, we are facing incredible proliferation of the national laws. And there is a concern in the community, you can hear that across narratives at the IGF uh, at this year's forum, that there is a concern that this may lead to fragmentation and that we need to be very careful in terms of uh, not allowing that we actually regulate something that may jeopardize the global nature of the internet that we are all really firmly standing for and advocating, and that is one internet accessible, affordable, safe, secure, resilient, sustainable, unfragmented. So those are the changes that I think we have to be aware, and I hope that the assessments that have been done in the early years could be also maybe looked at to ensure just that they are uh, relevant and to work, of course, on the outreach to ensure that this valuable set of indicators is brought to the attention of those that are probably still not aware that it exists. Thank you, Katarina. Thank you very much, uh, Anya, for your excellent uh, points uh, and excellent cooperation. Um, and the points will be definitely taken on board uh, as we move forward. Um, and uh, just picking up on your point about uh, reassessing the assessments, I think now we we've, uh, for example, we've uh, we've completed actually Kenya is completing uh, the follow up what we call follow up assessment, which is basically reassessing the assessment. Um, and uh, Grace is not here today, but uh, Simon has read uh, uh, the assessment. I don't know if he would like to share anything on that. So I think uh, we we are s uh, we are thinking about uh, this follow up phase uh, to see. Actually, one of the points as well uh, steps is the monitoring um, process, which aims to see the progress of the country, which uh, could uh, could then uh, reassess what has been done and uh, the validity and uh, progress made by the country. So this is an excellent point as well, in addition to others. Thank you very much. So as I mentioned, Simon, I would like now to give the floor to Simon who has um, who who is uh, currently acting as a, as a technical advisor for the IUI Romex project uh, looking into the reports that we receive and also uh, of course uh, uh, doing uh, providing uh, training and uh, uh, support to the multi-stakeholder advisory group uh, board also to the um, uh, researchers uh, so he's actually more recently involved also closely in the assessment of the um, uh, project um, um, in uh, South Pacific uh, Islands, um, Tuvalu, Solomon Islands, Vanuatu, Tonga and Fiji. Please, Simon, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Tethovic. So, I mean, I, I think to start with it, it, that IUI is really a unique holistic system for taking this overall picture of the internet in, in countries. And um, really, I haven't much to say because everybody else has said it already and I completely agree with what's come through. But uh, I'll take three or four points and a couple of examples. Um, so it is a national assessment, not an international assessment. It's about what happens in the country. And in that sense as well, it's, it doesn't have to produce kind of a single definitive answer. So 
through the map, through the analyses, there can be different viewpoints, and those different viewpoints can be incorporated. The indicators in IUI are in the form of a question, and so countries are effectively encouraged to answer that question, and sometimes the answer to the question may not be a yes or a no, but maybe something in between. And, and, and that leads to something again that I think people have mentioned, but it's worth um, bringing out again. I think Anna just mentioned it. This sense that, that yes, that, that one of the major aspects of this is rights and legislation. Um, but then what IUI does systematically throughout is say, and is that implemented? How does that work out in practice? So, for example, many of the points uh, about if certain laws are in uh, um, data protection, for example, are in place. Um, the question then is, is there something, for example, from case law, from uh, civil society analyses, which suggests if that is followed up on, if that works, and, and how that works in practice? So again, what you're doing is not a simple answer, but is a, a, is a full analysis of the question. Um, and, and I think that leads again into this sense of, of follow-up. So for each report then, naturally, you lead into recommendations. And as now we're getting into um, you know, 40 or more countries, we have to really say, well, what then is happening as a result of that? And, and, and as, as Tatavik has just suggested, uh, uh, Grace Gataiga has uh, um, conducted the first follow-up assessment for Kenya. But I think that as the first one, we still have to establish what is the best way for follow-up on the ground to see whether recommendations are taken forward, but also then um, how frequently should there be IUI assessments and what should the nature of reporting, because you don't want to recopy 300 indicators and say nothing's changed. So, so that whole sense of follow-up is extremely important and is one of the big questions here. And the second big question, which everybody's tackled, is, is new themes. And, and really, the three themes that are clearly emerging are AI, um, uh, and then environment and sustainability, and cybersecurity. AI is, is very much new in the IOI environment, but there are some indicators in environment and cybersecurity already in the X category of IUI. Um, and then to take that for environment, the one question, for example, which I'm keen on is e-waste. And uh, um, that is uh, particularly a problem um, in the countries I've worked at in Asian Pacific. So for example, in Southeast Asia, uh, there are, um, they are sometimes dumping grounds for uh, e-waste from uh, OECD from Europe and North America, and um, often that e-waste is then uh, processed in, in not very good working conditions, let's say. Uh, and so this whole issue brings up all sorts of questions about uh, environmental uh, um, concerns. Uh, in the Pacific, where we're now working, some countries, literally the country is as high as the table. So waste cannot be put in the ground. Uh, waste has to be disposed of in some other way. Uh, and, and again, this leads to whole issues about recycling and contamination and what you do and where you put it. Um, to take another example from the Pacific, which is, again, isn't quite and, and shows to some degree how IUI can adjust, but in some degree as well how we need to make that sensitivity to national circumstances. Um, for the Pacific, connectivity is about satellites. In one country, islands can be thousands of miles apart. There's no way that you can cable between them, and there's no way that you can put masts or anything between them. So satellites is it for those countries. If they're ever to have full connectivity, not just to the world and the internet as a whole, but even within the same country. Um, and I think that also then emphasizes, to come back to the point that David made originally about the sense of core and non-core. So certainly certain things are core and apply to every country, but certain elements, such as I've suggested the Pacific with waste and satellites, are, are core to the Pacific, but perhaps less core in, in other countries. And we need to make, keep that flexibility 
and we need to ensure that um, the IUI allows a national holistic view for a whole range of different types of country from small islands right up to huge countries like Brazil, which in itself, I always used to say that if anything, if, it, if it, something works in Brazil, it'll work anywhere because there's so many different environments in Brazil. Um, so I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon, and thank you uh, for, th for this contribution and uh, for your work. Um, now I think we heard from all the speakers. I wanted to ask if anybody online from the participants or participants here in the room have any questions or points to be made. Yes, Fabio, please. Hello, thank you. No, I, I would like to hear from, from the panelists uh, uh, the point of mood stakeholderism. That I think one, one thing that is interesting in the, in the indicator is that uh, not just the process is mood stakeholder because you, you have to collect indicators throughout a mood stakeholder process, but uh, the mood stakeholderism is a is a, a, a dimension of the indicator. So there's a list of indicators covering this. And do you think this is, uh, if this is something that al is also changing nowadays, if there are some new indicators in, in the field of mood stakeholders that five years ago uh, we, we, we don't had. So how do you, do you assess this, this part of the, the discussion? So thank you. Thank you, Fabio. Who would like to take the question? Thanks, Fabio. I, I, I think I'm not going to answer it completely directly, but, but as I said in the previous session, on, on I think in the multi-stakeholder dimension, um, and, and David kind of referred to this sense of ticking boxes, I think it's important to look at um, for there as to what multi-stakeholder means. And I guess this is kind of what you... It, it's not just that somebody turned up to a meeting, it's that they're actively engaged. And I'm not sure how we do that. And maybe also this is another question to, as it were, put out there. But really to have this sense of um, how we, can we engage. It, for example, in the reports for e-government, um, there are a lot of countries that have e-government systems and you see them put out things to consultation. And people have said that civil society reps have said they sent things in. But then they said, but we don't know whether anything was ever taken into account. So, so... Um, I think that sense of how real participation and what that looks like and how you would capture that I is a question here. Um, for, for new sectors, new stakeholders, I, 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 don't, I don't think I see anything immediately of, 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 uh, that's changed. Um, but uh, I'm trying to... Yes, just to complement. This is a very good question because... Um, this is the only dimension or set of uh, indicators that represents both a uh, principle of mode, stakeho mode stakeholderism and also the indicators. They capture how a given country is really um, implementing or supporting or fostering a mode stakeholder dialogue. In terms of um, new actors, I don't see any new actors in terms of um, when you consider government, uh, technical community, civil society, and private sector. I think this doesn't change. But maybe uh, there is one thing that doesn't exist in the um, uh, set of indicators in terms of how can we measure the outcomes of this multi-stakeholder dialogue. Because um, referring to my country again, Brazil, um, we have the M Brazilian multi um, Internet Steering Committee as a multi-stakeholder body that has produced along more than almost 30 years. Uh, we are go going to complete a third year of this model in two years' time because it was created in 1995. I think that we can list a large number of important outcomes that has driven loss regulations like um, the, the Brazilian GDPR, the data protection law, 
uh, like the law of access to information, and not to mention the very important um, legislation, which is the Internet Bills of Rights, that uh, is called Marco Civil. It was 100% uh, based on the 10 principles uh, that was uh, discussed through many years in within this multi-stakeholder uh, structure. So one new indicator that I would think of is the um, outcome, how to measure the outcome of this multi-stakeholder dialogue. But I think that differently from the three other dimensions or principles of the Rome X, um, this I don't see many changes. You can hear me now. No, thank you very much, Fabio. I completely agree with uh, my colleagues. Uh, I don't see, in theory, that we need to change anything on a, on a paper. But at the IGF Secretariat and also within the IGF, we do see gaps. And that's what I was saying at the beginning uh, during the introductory remarks. There are stakeholders that are just not participating within certain stakeholder groups. And I think who well illustrated that was um, the judge that spoke during the opening ceremony, I don't know if, you, if you've heard, when he said that he had issues at the registration area because he said, I come from a high court of Tanzania, I'm a judge, and then some colleagues had uh, difficulty to place him under a certain stakeholder group. Uh, I mean, it was a very nice um, way to illustrate that those are types of um, subgroups, I would say, you know, within our traditional stakeholder groups that are missing to actively participate in our dialogues, in our processes. We've recognized that a couple of years ago also with legislators, with parliamentarians, and that's what prompted this parliamentary track at the IGF that's been going on since 2019. But I do think there's much more to do. For example, look at the health industry. We speak a lot about the privacy there, but you don't really speak with you know, medical professionals at the IGF. You speak with uh, people coming from other backgrounds, which are mostly patients in these domains. So this is something that I think we need to work on to engage them more. We need to raise awareness. Uh, that's probably um, the, the reason why we don't have them here present. Car industry as well. I mean, a lot of issues with privacy, obviously, their data protection, and uh, they are not here. In Katowice, we heard a little bit uh, from Volkswagen, but uh, here today, we don't really have active participation from um, the highest management from these domains. So these are just some examples that I think it's important to work on. But we do have them on our paper. I think the authors of the indicators recognize that well. The matter is just raise awareness in practice and have them engaged. Thank you very much uh, for the question and uh, for the answers which will... Uh, yes, okay. On, on yeah, just to, to complement. Very interesting what you said, Anya. And I, I would say that um, the X dimension on the Romex could uh, accommodate other important uh, dimensions, like e the ethical dimension could be one um, set of indicators within the X, but uh, the other ones, uh, we don't have much to change, I guess. Uh, thank you very much. As I was saying, thank you, Fabio, for the question and for the um, answers, which uh, uh, which will help us, I believe, in the in the revision process. Um, uh, I wanted to ask the audience again if there are any reactions to what has been said, or if there are any questions, and the audience online. I don't see any questions online, so we're keeping to the time very, we're doing very good. So I would ju then, uh, we have uh, our director joining us uh, online. Um, I, before giving her the floor for, for the closing, official closing remarks, I don't know, Maria Elsa, if you had any contribution to, uh, to what has been said or uh, would you, uh, would we expect to hear the official closing remarks for you from you? Ah. Ah, thank you, Tatevika. I, I think I will weave them into you know the closing remarks, uh, so not to 
okay. you know, to, to make it two separate things. You know, so. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, then I would just like to give um, one final uh, floor to the s uh, speakers. Um, if you have any reflections on as we move uh, forward with the, uh, with the revision, if you have any final thoughts you would like to share, I would like to remind the audience and um, especially those who joined uh, a bit later uh, that we've been discussing the uh, the dynamic coalition as a platform to co to cooperate and to share best practices and lessons learned for for, for the implementation and promotion of the UNESCO's Internet Universality Romex uh, indicators, which is ongoing in 40 countries, and we've as we've reached the five-year mark, we're currently in the process of uh, updating the framework to to make sure that we incorporate the uh, the topics and uh, uh, input from lessons learned uh, from the implementation of, uh, of the IUI framework. So I'd uh, give the floor to Anja first, please, Anja. Thank you very much, Tatevik. I think just to thank you and uh, UNESCO, first of all, for um, using the IGF as a platform to promote these good values and bring them closer to people from around the world. We certainly at the IGF Secretariat, but I'm pretty sure I can speak also for other structures of the IGF as a project, uh, welcome our cooperation to continue long-term speaking as one UN family and to work as much as that's possible with uh, people from around the world to ensure that these values are really implemented in, uh, in practice for the internet that we all want. Thank you. Simon, please. I don't think, again, I have anything much further to say. Um, I'm still thinking about new actors. Um, I, I've, it's one thing I've seen in a few maps recently is the police involved, which is quite interesting. Uh, and I think there is something there about police and, uh, and justice. justice is a, there is a, an important indicator in the, uh, about training for judges and lawyers, which I think is, is quite key in all of this. But um, I, I think this is a, a really good assessment. I think it is producing um, very big results. Um, and uh, um, I look forward to the, a new version um, in relation to perhaps the Global Digital Compact um, in the beginning of next year. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to be here. Uh, and in my particular case, uh, being part of the uh, UNESCO family, I have to say that it is a real pleasure for me and for my team to work with UNESCO and to help fostering this idea of this uh, dialogue that is so important. And I think that we have to celebrate that uh, in such a short period of time, you have a large countries, um, a l large number of countries making the assessment and, and the dialogue is, um, live and I hope that in the coming years we can uh, make new assessments and in increase the number of countries that join this uh, framework um, in a voluntary basis as you, as you mentioned. And I think that UNESCO plays a, an important role in building capacity and raising awareness among co me uh, member states for the importance of having data to make this assessment. This is a very important issue. We, we do have um, a huge data gap, mainly in countries from the global south. So UNESCO plays a very important role, and I have to really congratulate for your leadership uh, in this project. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alessandra. Thank you to all of you, and thank you, Setic, indeed, for the excellent cooperation that we've be been enjoying and the serious work uh, uh, especially now when it comes to the revision. Uh, I would now like to, I'm happy to give the floor to um, Marielsa Oliveira, who is the director for uh, digital, uh, tr uh, digital policies uh, and transformation at UNESCO. Uh, please, Marielsa, the floor is yours. Thank you, Tate Vick, and hello, everyone. Konnichiwa. Uh, I'm really sorry that I could not join before, but I had uh, other sessions. Uh, I've been in sessions since 2 a.m. Paris time. Um, and many of those actually 
was talking about the Rome Act as well, advocating for it and including it in the topics. But for me, this session, which is focused specifically on the revision of the Rome Act framework, is the most special one. We've been working together as a dynamic coalition, you know, to advance the internet universality for the past five years. And over this, those years, we actually accomplished quite a lot. And if you think about it, 25% of the countries of the world have actively adopted the Romax framework, and it has embedded itself in global and regional discourse about the internet. You know, it's at the highest levels. So it is no small measure uh, due to the work of the Internet Universality Dynamic Coalition and the way you have worked as a shared space to exchange expertise, to exchange experiences, to act as a peer-to-peer -peer support mechanism for each other. And this is a very generous attitude, you know, of all of you. And which the richness of our collective experiences, you are the right people to contribute and guide the fifth year revision of the Internet Universality Indicators. It has been envisioned from the very beginning. We always knew the internet to be a fast changing environment. So we always considered that uh, these indicators would have to be revised at some point. But nevertheless, it comes at a very timely moment in which we see digital governance uh, changing. It, it, it under a major overhaul with it, the uh, new, for example, the, the upcoming global digital compact, the WISIS plus 20 review and so others. We also see generative AI changing you know, the landscape, the technological landscape of the internet itself. And what we have found out that the internet can also be harmful. This is something that we didn't realize but, uh, before as much, but the harms that can be done when it serves as a conduit for disinformation, for hate speech and other harmful content, particularly at scale you know, that, that it operates. And the environment has changed so much too with the indicators needing to change. Uh, in this session, we have looked at this scenario and asked ourselves, what are the things that we must change about the internet universality framework? And you know, I'm sure that you have uncovered important elements, but I heard some of those in, in the end and I would like to mention you know, that this include, for example, a tighter specification of which are the core indicators and this is one of the things that I consider particularly relevant. We need to really um, tighten up uh, the core indicators to, to give a, a, an easier process, uh, including for the, the measure, measurement as well as for the follow-up. The potential inclusion of new dimensions, uh, both in terms of content, such as you know, what Simon was referring to, uh, environment and in waste, cybersecurity, but others that have come up through you know, uh, different mechanisms of consultation, such as child data protection, mental health. And of course, we also have AI, the toxicity levels of the internet itself, you know, of, of the social media environment, and uh, some of the elements that we need co to consider, um, but also in terms of the assessment process itself. For example, you know, accounting for research obstacles that uh, many of the national teams have encountered, including the lack of data for many indicators, particularly disaggregated data that then doesn't allow us to see the X dimension so, you know, so clearly, but including um, as well as when and how to conduct follow-ups to monitor progress in implementing the recommendations, which I find an essential mechanism. And I think that it's really important that we document this process as well, because we are you know, about to have a new global digital compact. And we will have principles and commitments in that, in, in that, at that level as well. So it's it, the, the process of monitoring adherence to principles. It's one of the most important things that actually going to be happening. And the example that the Romax framework offers is extraordinary. So I, I'd like to offer that as my key, uh, um, uh, um, uh, contribution today is reminding us that we need to, to document this process, this trajectory, to, to show uh, also the global uh, uh, digital compact process what could be, you know, uh, how they could actually be uh, taking care of implementing it. So with that, I'd like to really extend heartfelt appreciation to all the panelists, uh, the actually good friends who have joined us today. 
uh, to share these insights uh, and uh, you know say that your participation is always enriching and enriches our understanding of the path that we must take forward to achieve this shared objective or updating the uh, framework. I'd like to extend my special gratitude to our partners at CETIC.vr. You know, Alexandre and Fabio have been really supportive and collaborative in this process, uh, taking up quite a lot uh, uh, of the work, but also, you know, Simon, who is, uh, you know, uh, um, supporting, leading this, and to our esteemed steering committee members uh, for their uh, support in advance in this review. And just like your constructive suggestions and advice have enabled UNESCO to facilitate the implementation of the Romax uh, national assessment in the last year, we are now able to successfully adapt this framework with your help. And for that reason, I really encourage all of you to remain actively engaged in the revision process, to continue sharing with your inputs with us. And Tata Vic has uh, certainly uh, uh, given you uh, um, a mechanism to reach out uh, if you have contributions to make. We have always counted on our dynamic coalition, but this year we really count on you more than ever you are the ones who have on the ground understanding of national needs, of the difficulties the Rome research typically faces, of the themes about which you wish to could, you could know more about, and so on. So your guidance is absolutely indispensable. So let me invite also all IGF stakeholders to join the Internet Universality Indicators Dynamic Coalition and to help us to continue advancing this work of advocating for a human-centered Internet. So Thank you all very, very much for your support, and I hope to see you in person again soon. Bye. Thank you very much, uh, Maria Elsa. Thank you for, for these rich uh, remarks and uh, points that we will also take on during our uh, steering committee meeting, closed door meeting. Uh, uh, tomorrow and uh, from my end as well I would like to really extend a heartfelt thank you to each uh, panelist and each member of the steering of, of, uh, of the dynamic coalition who has been supporting us throughout uh, the years uh, who are not here today uh, but who remain actively engaged uh, through uh, through different initiatives uh, around Romex so Thank you so very much. Um, I would also like to uh, thank my colleagues, uh, the Romex team, uh, especially Karen Landa and Camila Gonzalez, who are online with us now. Um, and I would like to also thank the participants who have been here. We are happy to uh, hear from you um, after the session. We, we will be around. And I would like to continue the tradition that my colleagues have established of taking a family photo. And I'd like to ask the online participants as well to put on their cameras um, and colleagues as well. Thank you.